Welcome to the ministry meeting this afternoon. <clears throat> We're very glad to see you and trust that what we talk about today may be useful and challenging as well. Before I open the word and start my slides, let's ask the Lord's blessing on the meeting. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hymn which equates or at least compares the breaking of the bread on the side of the Sea of Galilee to the opening of your word. We remember the prophet said, your words were found and I did eat them and they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. We thank you for speaking to us through your word. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for a revelation that gives us everything we need to know to be saved, to find peace with God, to come into a relationship with you. We thank that we have everything in the word of God to teach us and fortify us so that we are equipped for life and for godly living. We thank you these words are not just English words or German words or whatever language a person may be reading, but they are the word of God and they have a very special power. And we thank you, Father, for that life transforming words. So as we consider the great benefit that we have of having our English Bibles, <clears throat> We pray that we will appreciate what was paid by many people with their blood in order that we might have <clears throat> what we take so much for granted. We pray we may study it, devote ourselves to it, and follow its precepts. We pr pray, Father, for a greater understanding of what the Bible is and a greater appreciation for it and a greater desire to study it as a result of this hour we spend together. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to read a verse in Isaiah 66 to begin with. I always like to say, read something from the scripture to begin with. And we'll begin reading. 
And verse number two, maybe verse number one, because it's breaking into the middle to start at verse number two. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord, but this is the one to whom I will look. The great God who is on the throne of the universe looks down at human beings and this is the one he looks to, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. If we really understood what the word of God was, we would tremble as we read it. We would show it the greatest respect and we would treasure it more than we do. So I want to talk today about the Bible, but there's so many things we could talk about the Bible. I've chosen to focus on the history of the English Bible. And at the end, I'm going to give a critique of some of the very common versions that are out there, the newer versions, the ones that you probably have or uh, read. <clears throat> I read many versions myself. I'm not beholden to one. But I suppose all of us have a favorite and the one that we spend our time with and the one I hope you're trying to memorize. So <clears throat> whether that's the good old King James Version or the ESV, we need to understand the quality of the translations that we have and compare them with others. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> history here for a little while and remind ourselves that after the Christian era began in the West and for everywhere but in the uh, Orthodox, uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean where Greek was still spoken, the Bible was the Vulgate. The Bible was in Latin. It was the only version available and it was the only version you were allowed to read because the Roman Catholic Church said so. And we're going to find out how strident they became over this very fact that they did not want the housewife at her sink or the weaver at his shuttle or the plowman turning over turves of grass to be reading the Bible for themselves. It had to be interpreted by the intelligentsia. It had to be doled out by a priest because you were not capable of understanding it yourself. Therefore, it had to be given to you and you had to understand what it meant from the official church uh, position. So <clears throat> this is the Vulgate of Psalm 94, 16 through 20. We're not going to read it, but it is uh, something translated by a man named Jerome. We're not going to get into the history of it. The first English Bibles were not whole Bibles. They were just pieces of Bibles, and they were done surreptitiously and sort of on the side because there was no way you could officially make an English translation. So his, this is a, a man named Aldhelm, the Bishop of Sherborne, and he was thought to have written an English translation of the Psalms. Again, a whole translation of the Bible was forbidden by the church. This was around the year 700, and that would perhaps be the oldest version, although there's no extant copy of that. And then we come a little farther along to the man who is called the Venerable Bede. Whenever you read about Bede, or Bede, or however you pronounce his name, it's always says the Venerable Bede. He was a Benedictine monk in Northumbria, and he translated the Gospel of John into English, which he finished on his deathbed. So Aldhelm had done some of the Psalms, and by the year 720, 735, we have at least part of the Gospel of John, probably the whole thing, translated by Bede. Bede was quite a polymath, quite a great man. He's considered the father of English history, among other things. And there's his work, uh, the works of the Venerable Bede, you can see written in Latin in 1563. And if you go to Durham Cathedral in England, you can see his tomb to this day. We move a little farther ahead to the 800s, and we have King Alfred the Great circulating a number of passages in the vernacular tongue, in other words, Old English. Pieces, the Ten Commandments, the Pentateuch, and certain portions of the Psalms. There's Alfred the Great. You can see his statue if you go to Winchester. Here is an example, though, of Old English. This is the Lord's Prayer, and as you look at it, you realize you can't read that. So I don't think you can anyway, unless there's an Old English scholar here. 
We talk about the King James being Old English. It's not Old English. It's not even Middle English. It's Modern English, but it is a very old form of Modern English, something we often call Elizabethan English because it was written during the reign of good Queen Bess. So we can't read these Old English uh, words too well, but at the time, at least some of the scriptures were available to some very privileged people. I want to talk about the Lindisfarne Gospels for a moment. And this was a group of beautifully prepared manuscripts on soft calfskin vellum that included um, a good portion of the Gospels, probably all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, since it was being published, it was in Latin. We're going to talk about the fact that somebody had the nerve to make an interlinear of this later, which is the first published version of English, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's stuck in between the Latin lines of the Lindisfarne Gospels. So this is an island off the coast of Northumbria, one of those um, estuaries where <clears throat> you can get out there by boat. It's quite shallow. Uh, and the monks there from Iona were, uh, were um, making these beautiful documents, which I'll show you in a moment, until the Vikings came. Now, you know, the Viking era in English history actually began at this time, and this is the first documented Viking raid and they raided the island of Lindisfarne and the coastal area on the northeast of England. This is an example of the Lindisfarne Gospel at the start of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Cairo is a two Greek letters. You can see how beautifully, almost like uh, a carpet, almost you think of it like, um, what do you call them, Hagopian rugs. <laughs> Not, pardon? Tapestry, that's a good word. I'm thinking of the, the Byzantine uh, kind of detail that's in those kind of rugs that uh, people... Anyway, we won't go off the cuff any longer. So, uh, not expecting to read that, but just uh, I, I hope it's big enough you can see how beautiful this is. Now, obviously, we're talking about way before the printing press, so everything had to be done by hand. It would take about nine months to copy out the scriptures, and the cost of that was around 2,000 pigs in England at the time uh, of, of Wycliffe, and that's a lot. That's the same number of pigs that went down into the sea we learned about from Mark chapter 5. So that's a whole lot of pigs. It's a lot of money. So it was not something most people had. But the care and the painstaking that they took to make these beautiful documents is really something to behold. Here's another from the Gospel of Luke. And it begins the first words of that gospel, again in Latin. We're going to move ahead, though, because we have a lot of ground to cover, and we're going to move to John Wycliffe. <clears throat> Wycliffe, called the morning star of the Re Reformation. We're going to talk about the Lollards and Lollardy in a minute. Lollard means mumbler. And were they really mumblers? Not really, but the church officials said they were mumblers because they went around lay people, people without official degrees, teaching the Bible, and they were preaching it in the streets. And they were, they were uh, s speaking very much out against some of the excesses of the Roman Catholic Church at the time, such as indulgences. <clears throat> I think most of you are aware of what those are. <clears throat> and also, Wycliffe was convinced that transubstantiation, another big word referring to the fact that the church position was that the body and blood of Christ are actually represented in the emblems, and when you ingest them, you're actually taking physically part of the body and the blood of Christ. It's transformed as you partake of it, which, of course, the Bible doesn't teach, but that is still taught by that church today. Wycliffe didn't agree with that. Wycliffe believed in justification by faith, even for Martin Luther, We're kind of ways before Luther here. And so Wycliffe and his, and his men were convinced that they were going to get the Bible into the hands of the average reader as much as they could. They didn't have a printing press now, but they were able to make copies, and Wycliffe himself would die before he completed this, but his good friend, uh, John Purvey, completed this, and so we have the Wycliffe Bible. Now, what were the documents that the Wycliffe's Bible was based on? They were Latin. So he's translating out of the Vulgate into English, not, through, not Greek and Hebrew. Those were not available to him, but right out of the Latin. So here are, here's John Wycliffe preaching. He's, uh, this is the Lollard movement, as we call it, and he's proclaiming the gospel to people, lay people, and giving them a chance to hear the actual words of Scripture in their own language. 
Now, Pope Martin V, by the way, during his life, Wycliffe was condemned as a heretic, but he was not, he was not killed. He died a natural death. But at the Council of Constance, this uh, religious fraud named Pope Martin V not only condemned John Huss to death, but he also demanded that Wycliffe's bones be exhumed from his tomb because it was on consecrated ground, burned and thrown into the river 41 years after he died. And so here we have a picture of it, the bones and ashes of Reverend Mr. John Wycliffe being th of Lutterworth being thrown into the River Swift by these religious phonies. It really gets your blood boiling sometimes when you see these people pretending to be servants of God and to speak for the Lord and treating one of his choice servants this way. Here they are, again, pulling up the bones of John Wycliffe so that he can be burned and thrown into the swift. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a great line on this. The Avon to the Severn runs, the Severn to the sea, and Wycliffe's dust shall spread abroad, wide as the waters be. In other words, they took that dust out of the grave and threw it in the river, and it went down from the swift to the Severn, to the Avon first, and then the Severn, and then down into the sea, and went all over the world. That's a very insightful poem. Wide as the waters be, Wycliffe's message and Wycliffe's view of the scriptures would long outlive him. John Wycliffe said, Holy Scripture is the highest authority for every believer, the standard of faith, and the foundation for reform. Now, <clears throat> some great events happened after the time of Wycliffe. In the 1400s, 1440, we have the printing press, the movable type Gutenberg, Gutenberg printing press that came in Europe. Uh, the Chinese and others had done woodblock printing for many, many centuries, but this was movable type. Uh, he was a goldsmith, actually, so he was very good at working with little pieces of type, and I have more slides on that, but I didn't include them. But Gutenberg's uh, Bible and the fact that we could now mass produce Bibles was exceedingly important. Another very important event, which I don't think I have on this set of slides, is the fall of Constantinople. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the Ottoman Turks came and they moved from the east into what we call Turkey today. And the Byzantine Empire, which was there, which was Greek speaking, which had Greek manuscripts of the scriptures, moved into Europe. They were fleeing from the Ottomans. And when they moved into Europe, they brought essentially the Renaissance. This is the time of Raphael, of Michelangelo, of Galileo, um, of um, scientists like Copernicus, and of course Erasmus. And if you don't know who Erasmus was, he was a Dutch scholar who made the first Greek edition available to scholars of the New Testament. And it is Erasmus's version that is behind the Greek text, that is the Greek text rather, that is behind the King James Version. So here's an example of a Gutenberg of Bible printed in 50, 1454, some 14 years after the printing press was invented. And these are amazing books, if you ever get a chance to see one uh, up close. It's, um, it's just quite moving to see them. Notice the tremendous care that was taken, even though this was a mass-produced volume, in putting all that artwork on the, on the page as well. So there's a printing press, one of the early types of a Gutenberg printing press. And there's some movable type loaded in the, uh, on the composing stick from the letter case. And there's Johannes at work. <clears throat> and the fall of Constantinople, I guess I did have that in here. Okay, so that's very important. Another event that had preceded that, of course, was the Black Death, which caused thousands and thousands of people in every town to die. Much of the population of Europe was decimated. As many as a third of people died in many of these towns. <clears throat> this is one of the things that most moved Wycliffe in one of the earlier versions of the plague, but it continued to occur many, many times right through the 1800s. So this is Raphael, the School of Athens. This, this idea of Renaissance came from Greek learning, which had been in Byzantium and arrived in Europe because the Muslims pushed it there. This is very important because that is where the idea of translating the Bible from original languages into English first came. With the Reformation, <clears throat> uh, the, the increase in learning in the scriptures gave rise, of course, to the Reformation. We said that 
John Wycliffe was the morning star of the Reformation 100 years earlier. But now we have all the great reformers coming along, and these are the famous solas of the Reformation by Scripture alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone, is what those words mean. And we come to William Tyndale. William Tyndale was another very, what we call him a polymath, meaning he had tremendous knowledge in many areas, and he was a great linguist. He could speak uh, fluently, they say, as many as 12 languages, and he was influenced a lot by Martin Luther. A lot of the people in England, because they had to see what the climate was, and generally it was very hostile to the translation of uh, any of the Bible into English, they would move to Europe. Famously, we know the Dutch have always been tolerant of everything, <laughs> so a lot of people went to Holland. They also could go to Geneva, because there in Switzerland, John Calvin and others had turned this into a Protestant haven. And they could go to Wittenberg, they could see Martin Luther. So a lot of these English people spent time on the continent. And we'll see that was true of William Tyndale as well. Tyndale was, of course, condemned as well as Wycliffe was, and re regarded as a heretic, and a, a price was placed on his head. But Wycliffe defied the Pope. He said, I think I have it later, but I'll just say it now in case it isn't on the slide. If God spares my life long enough, the common boy at the plow will know more of the word of God than you. He's talking to the Pope. And <clears throat> that indeed came to pass. This is the beginning of the Gospel of John of a 1525 Tyndale Bible. And it's just, uh, you know, if you look at it really hard, you have this kind of the font there that's a little bit <clears throat> intense, but you can make it out. Gospel spelled with two L's at the end. You see these spelling changes, but generally speaking, quite readable. Tyndale's New Testament was completed by Tyndale, and the Old Testament was completed by his friend Miles Coverdale and others, so that <clears throat> the complete Tyndale Bible was finally published. Now, we owe many, many words to Tyndale. Here's some examples. Passover, scapegoat, my brother's keeper, knock and it shall be opened unto you, seek and ye shall find, ask and it shall be given you, judge not that ye be not judged, the word of God which liveth and lasteth forever, that there be light, the powers that be, the salt of the earth, a law unto themselves, it came to pass, the signs of the times, filthy lucre, and the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now these are King James phrases, but they come from Tyndale. As we're going to see, the King James is a revision of a revision of a revision of a revision. Okay. And the original one was Tyndale's. And 86% uh, of the New Testament in the King James Version is pretty much directly from Tyndale. And about 70% of the Old Testament wording comes from Tyndale and Coverdale. So these were extremely influential men. And the words that they gave us in the 1500s are still with us today. T Tyndale, of course, uh, because he was against the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, uh, he was very careful in his interpretation, or, or I should say translation, of words to use plain English words. So he used overseer instead of bishop. The church wanted him to use bishop, or they didn't want him to translate at all. But I mean, that was the word that they wanted. And elder, <clears throat> in some Catholic versions, was called priest. It's not even the word for priest. But that's what they insisted it be translated as. Charity. <clears throat> we see that in 1 Corinthians 13 in the King James Version. Right? Charity suffereth long, rather than the word love, which is probably unnecessary. And congregation he liked rather than the word church. By the order of the Archbishop of Canterbury, all of those words except priest were brought back into the King James Version when it was translated because the church hierarchy did not like these common terms. Um, we won't read any. I guess they had two slides on that. All right. So, Tyndale did not die a natural death. He was murdered. And here are the three men responsible for his death. Um, Thomas Arundel probably should be on there too, but we won't worry about that. Henry VIII, Thomas More, and John Stokesley the Bishop of London. Now, Tyndale was over in Belgium, 
and he was working from Belgium. And he was betrayed by a friend and put into house arrest. Tyndale's trial finally arrived 18 months after he was imprisoned. A long line of charges were drawn up. First, he had maintained that faith alone justifies. Imagine that. Second, he maintained that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel was enough for salvation. And we believe that. That's the same gospel we preach today. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's faith in the finished work of Christ that saves faith alone. And that's exactly what Tyndale preached. Third, he averred that human traditions cannot bind the conscience except where their neglect might occasion scandal. Fourth, he denied the freedom of the will. Fifth, he denied that there is any purgatory. I'm not sure he denied the freedom of the will in the absolute sense. These are the charges against him. Most of them are actually compliments. Sixth, he affirmed that neither the Virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. Seventh, he asserted that neither the Virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. And so the list continues. There's actually more charges than that. Um, so he was condemned as a heretic and let out. I, this, this should have been a suppressed slide. I don't like to put all these text slides here. Anyway, we'll keep, we'll keep going because I think I have... Yeah, here's the death of William Tyndale. Before being garroted and burnt at the stake in Vilvoorde, which is in Belgium, he cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. This is a woodcut from Fox's Book of Martyrs. So the two famous phrases uh, from William Tyndale are, if God spares my life, the boy run, uh, turning the plow or the boy at the plow will know more than the Pope, okay, more than you. And this is the other one as his dying words, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Well, it turns out within two years of his death, the first, Henry VIII, who was not a good man, and he had, the reason Henry VIII didn't like Tyndale is he spoke against his marriage annulment, just like John the Baptist. That's what got him in trouble, because uh, <clears throat> otherwise Henry VIII could have been fairly favorable toward an English translation since he had departed from the Catholic Church and formed the Church of England, right? so that he could get divorced, basically. So, it's not funny, but that's the way it was. So, um, within two years, the Matthew Bible came out. What's the Matthew Bible? It's a pseudonym, Thomas Matthew, okay? Thomas means the twin, right? And this is actually a way of referring to William Tyndale without saying Tyndale, because Henry VIII would never have allowed Tyndale's name to be on the Bible. So it's called the Matthew Bible, and it was a der derived directly from Coverdale and Tyndale and the work that they did. So, if God here's it, here's the real the real quote: If God spares my life, ere many years I will cause a boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. And so Tyndale is put to death in the, the Netherlands with all these religious hypocrites and phonies and frauds around him again and dies a martyr's death. There is a memorial to William Tyndale in Vilgoord if you go to the country of Belgium today. This is a famous line again from Tyndale. <clears throat> Evangelion, if you will, uh, that what we call the gospel is a Greek word and signifieth good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings that maketh a man's heart glad and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy. I love that. That's exactly what the gospel does. It brings joy because it's great to know your sins are forgiven and you're heading to heaven and you're absolutely secure in the work of Christ. And William Tyndale certainly knew that. Here's a Tyndale Bible from Oxford. And again, you can't see it very clearly, but you see all the ornate work that was done around the center, although it was actually a printing, printing press publication. In fact, all of these uh, ornate things around are not necessarily hand done. These are also part of the impress. Again, here is an <clears throat> example of the Gospel of John. Um, <clears throat> okay, and a famous painting of Tyndale with his name in Latin. Now, there's an interesting story here, and I'm about where I want to be in this meeting halfway through. <clears throat> so we're going to compare... Tyndale to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
they're strikingly similar. So as he asked, uh, if you recall that in 2 Timothy 4, he's asking that the books and the parchments be brought and bring my cloak, right, uh, that I left at Troas, and he's requesting these things to be brought to the dungeon where he is, not only for his comfort, but also, more importantly, so that he could continue to study the scriptures. So in the dungeon, uh, William Tyndale says, I beg your lordship and that of the Lord Jesus that if I am to remain here through the winter, you will request the commissary to have the kindness to send me from the goods of mine which he has a warmer cap, for I suffer greatly from cold in the head and am afflicted by a perpetual catarrh, which is much increased in this cell. A warmer coat also for this which I have is very thin, a piece of cloth too to patch my leggings. My overcoat is worn out. My shirts are also worn out. He has a woolen shirt. If he will be good enough to send it. I have also with him leggings of thicker cloth to put on above. He has also warmer nightcaps. And I ask to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening. It is indeed wearisome sitting alone in the dark. Again, a reminder of what men paid in order that we might have the scriptures in our own language. But most of all, he goes on, I beg and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the commissary that he will kindly permit me to have the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary that I may pass the time in that study. In return, may you obtain what you most desire so that so only that it be for the salvation of your soul. But if any other decision has been, has been taken concerning me to be carried out before winter, that's another expression from 2 Timothy 4, before winter, right? I will be patient, abiding the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit I pray may ever direct your heart. Amen. And he signs it, William Tyndale. Well, in the Mamertine dungeon, Paul says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. There's a picture of the Mamertine prison in Rome, by the way, where both Peter and Paul were said to be in prison, a dungeon. It didn't have the uh, monument back then. <laughs> It was just the stones and the damp, and the damp and the dark, and the dark. <clears throat> so the, I'm with, there's there's a lot of other Bibles that come into play here, and it's not my purpose to go through all of those. <clears throat> but I made the statement that the King James is a fifth revision, and indeed it is because Tyndale was first, Matthew Bible was second, Coverdale, and then the Great Bible, <clears throat> and then the Bishop's Bible. There's actually probably five iterations there before we finally get to the 1611 King James version. <clears throat> So we won't say too much about them. <clears throat> but these were really important in their day. And again, it became possible for a person to get a Bible for somewhat less than 2,000 pigs. <laughs> Still quite expensive, but not um, not that ex not, not a, a year's savings. <clears throat> the Geneva Bible also deserves mention. This is an English Bible. It's not a, 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 you know, a French or... Swiss Bible, but it was produced in Geneva because all of the expats from England who were chased over there by Bloody Mary, <clears throat> and <clears throat> Bloody Mary was responsible for the death of the man who published the Matthew Bible, which we mentioned, were living in Geneva. <clears throat> the Geneva Bible is the Bible of the pilgrims. The Geneva Bible is the Bible of Shakespeare. So it was very, very important and still uh, a very interesting edition to read. And here's an example of it. And here's the famous Breach's version, <clears throat> uh, which is a small t a detail we don't have time for right now. But uh, some, of these, uh, some of these versions that have a strange word or uh, some uh, mistakes, actually, in the way they were printed are extremely valuable, like worth millions of dollars to the bright collector. So, uh, points about the Geneva Bible uh, followed the Great Bible of 1539, preceded the King James by about 50 years, the Bible of Shakespeare, Cromwell, Knox, Dunn, Bunyan, and the Mayflower Pilgrims. Oliver Cromwell's soldiers at the time of the English Civil War carried it in their pockets as they went marching off to Ireland to murder Irish people, singing the Psalms, which shows he sh should have been a dispensationalist, that <laughs> he would have realized the city of God is not being built on the earth today. So that's another topic for another time. But uh, Cromwell's soldiers were all outfitted with a Geneva Bible. 
This is the Bishop's Bible, and again, we're not going to say much about it, except that this is the version that the King James Version was based on in 1568. And here we have the frontispiece, or the uh, first page, with the dedication to the Most High and Mighty Prince James, by the grace of God, the 1611 King James Version. Some people call it Authorized Version, AV, but that's a misnomer. It's it, the, the, the very thing we're looking at right now says, appointed to be read in churches. Now that word appointed means something like you talk about your car has wonderful appointments. That is, it's equipped uh, to be a comfortable place to sit and to drive. And so this was appointed to be read in churches, meaning that it was meant to be read out loud and useful. No one authorized the King James Version, but some people who defend it love that expression. Anyway, <clears throat> um, the RSV translators said of the King James Version, if the King James Version kept felicitous phrases and apt expressions from whatever source which had stood the test of public usage, it owed most, especially in the New Testament, to Tyndale, and we've already mentioned that. Here's the frontispiece, actually, to the 1611 version, and if you were to study that, you would see Moses and Aaron flank the center Holy Bible. We have the um, apostles with Judas turning his face away, all depicted on the top, and we have the four gospel writers with their appropriate animals in the four corners. And the name uh, Yahweh on the top, the tetra tetragrammaton, or the sacred name of God in Hebrew, is very, the very top. And here's our good friend Richard Bancroft, who was the one who oversaw the production of the King James Version, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the one who insisted on maintaining ecclesiastical terminology. So uh, we could study that more, but on we go. This is the um, Epistle of Paul, the Apostle to the Hebrews. Notice uh, we don't know that Paul wrote Hebrews, but at the time that was considered, and then the text follows. Very common to decorate initial letters like that. This is 1612 version in quarto size. Dan knows what that means. 1760 Cambridge edition. And this is the one that the current King James Version really is based on with a very, very slight revisions. So the one we have today is not the 1611 version. You could hardly read that because the English is quite dated. Then we have revised version 1881 coming out. And we're going to talk about other versions right now. <clears throat> So the King James Version was for approximately 200, 300, almost 300 years, the main Bible in English. And it certainly has served missionaries and the growth of um, assemblies and, and other Christian efforts throughout the last 300, 400 years. It is a great work, uh, not only of, of translation, but of literature. And there's no denying that. However, it became clear in the 1800s that it was becoming too dated in its language, number one. And number two, there was concern that the Greek texts that it was based on were not of the high quality that had been derived from further in, uh, investigation and from the uh, textual criticism, basically, which is another talk. But we've talked about that before, and you understand that there are many manuscripts, <clears throat> an abundance of them, a plethora of them, a, an embarrassment of riches, and yet they have slight differences, and so textual critics uh, go about the science, really. It's a bit of an art, but mainly a science of trying to determine what the original reading was. And in almost all cases, they come to very high certainty. So that is published in this book today, uh, Novum Testamentum Graeca in Latin. This is a book, I actually have this book, some of you may as well. And this is the current Nestle Allent Greek text. It's also the United Bible Society's Greek text. This is the one they're going to work from to translate any New Testament today. Similarly, <clears throat> here's a picture of it. Notice what's called the apparatus on the bottom, and it gives variant readings and grades them and tells what the sources are. So it's for scholars, obviously, but very useful. And this is the current Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's called the Stuttgart Bible. We owe a lot to the Germans, by the way, uh, for both of these texts, and not in a bad way. The German higher critics and all of that we have rightly uh, dismissed. But they've done a great deal of work in textual criticism and really set the standard for the rest of the world. 
So Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, is, that's, that is the Hebrew text that you're going to, all modern versions are going to be based on. So let's just take a little survey now about, with some of the newer versions and then talk a little bit about translation issues. I'm going to go somewhat chronologically. So we have 1881, 82, English Revised Version. Around 1901, we have an American version of that, American Standard Version. And then in 1952, we have a revised version. And we don't have to remember all this. These, these things came along. These are the forebears. These are the predecessors of the current uh, scope or spate of uh, translations we have available today. So the New American Standard was one of the very early ones. And it is exactly what it says it is. It's a American Standard Bible, the 1901 version, brought up to speed. And it appeared that this was going to disappear into oblivion. <laughs> accounting for less than 1% of Bible sales, but it's enjoyed a bit of a resurgence lately. And this is the, this is the one Johnny uh, C., for example, likes to read from. And I think A.J. Higgins wouldn't mind me saying as well on his, um, like Monday meditations and stuff, we'll go with the New American Standard. So, Features. It was published in 1963, but the complete Bible in 1971. I can attest to being at the dinner table in the mid-70s with my dad reading this. His friend Wayne Imason had given him a copy of this, so it goes back to my childhood. It's been revised at least three times. The, bio, the uh, textual basis is the Stuttgart Bible, and actually some of this, this is in the, 19, in the 2020 edition, is the Biblia Hebraica Quinta. That's going to be the new Masoretic text. Uh, it's got a new name now, if you care. <laughs> All right, And then the, the Greek New Testament we talked about before. Translation type, formal correspondence. Now we're going to talk about that. In fact, I may take a break right now to explain that. So up until about 1955, all translators pretty much agreed what their job was. It was to take the meaning of the original text and translate it into a receptor language. And that seems pretty straightforward. And it was the text that determined what you wrote and what you translated. It was the writer who was the most important. And the reader had to adapt to the writer. So when you looked at your translation, you were try they were trying to get you as close as possible to the original words, a word-for-word -word translation, as it's sometimes called. Now, you know that this is simplistic. There's no such thing as a word-for-word -word translation. First of all, there is no one word in one language that has exactly the same semantic range as the word in another language. There's, there's only overlap. So you're always going to be in danger of um, misleading people slightly from the nuances of the original word. But you can come pretty close. So we have, you know, um, dog and cat and things like that, obviously, are pretty much the same. Although in, uh, what do they say in French? A cat in my throat instead of a frog? <laughs> so, you know, things like that. Just nuances, even, even talking about um, what you might call uh, vernacular language differs. But anyway, the, the other form of translation arising in the 1950s is basically attributed to a scholar named Eugene Nida. And he said, no, it isn't so much word for word, but it needs to be thought for thought. We need to take what's in the original, and we have to have the person who read it get the same impression that the person would have read had they been reading the original language and were able to do so. So that means uh, the reader is more important than the writer. And the text has got to now conform to the reader rather than the reader conforming to the text. So that is a bit of a dangerous move, as you can see. It's part of the modern, you know, 1960s, uh, you know, everything's got to be easy, everything's got to be informal, you know, it's just the general sweep of our culture in the last 50 years has just definitely consumer mentality. What do people want to read? Take a poll, to see what their favorite version is. That's the one that's going to be selling and making money. Therefore, we, you know, it's, it's all those market forces and the commodification of this book have come into, uh, into a really big thing right now, and that's really a shame because the word of God should not be commodified. But anyway, that's some background to that. So newer translations tend toward what many people call a paraphrase. So you say, well, par isn't paraphrase thought for thought? Yes, but just as you can't have exactly word for word, you've got to make some alterations. All, all, let me put it this way, to a linguist, all translation is paraphrasis. 
Everything's paraphrase, okay? So you say, well, what use is the word then? Well, the way we use it, though, in English is to define a pole of the most loose, uh, the most um, for, far from the wording of the original text in order to create an impression. And we'll see uh, examples of that. So rather than saying much more about that, formal correspondence is word for word, the, tra- the classic way of doing translation for thousands of years. And this new dynamic equivalence <clears throat> was in, developed in the 60s and 70s and is really much more supposed to pander to the reader. Now, there's some good things about it. I mean, there are, we certainly do want to be understood, right? We want the language to be accessible to the reader, but not necessarily third grade level, okay? And the, the latest iteration of the NIV is all the way down to third grade level. So the Word of God is, has something to say to three-year-olds, but the rest of us should not be reading at a third grade level. The, 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 the document has way more theological heft than that, all right? So <clears throat> anyway, formal correspondence, dynamic equivalence. We'll see much more about that in a minute. Lockman Foundation. Okay, NIV next comes along. And this also came out in the 1970s, and it was revised a couple of times. It isn't necessarily a revision of any pre-existent translation, but was rather made from, I'm sure, a collection of them, and also de novo. Its textual basis will be the same. And it's sort of a, I put mixed formal and dynamic equivalence. It does what the Holman has tried to do and come up with some sort of blend they call optimal um, equivalence. We'll talk about that in a minute. But really, it's just, uh, for its time, the, the, if you look at the 1984 version or, or before, you will see that it is actually pretty good. I mean, it's pretty much uh, similar to the King James Version. But it has gotten much more loose in its later editions, and we'll look at some of those uh, examples. The reading level, all the way down to third grade. Publisher is Biblica, which disappeared off the bottom of my screen. New King James Version. Okay, so this came out in 1979 and 1982 for the Complete Bible. It was largely the work of Art Farstad. So Art Farstad does not believe in the Nestle Allen uh, critical text. He believes that the text behind the King James Version, essentially the Textus Receptus, is the best Greek text. And so he had a purpose in bringing the King James Version into modern usage and not to depart from the conflated readings that are so common in the King James Version. Great man. Art Farsad is a great man. Um, he's also the one behind the Holman standard, uh, Christian Standard Bible, but he died before it got very far. And so the people who were, we're going to see that in a moment, flipped over to the Nestle Allen text after that. Formal correspondence, ninth grade level, Harper Collins. I have for many years uh, used this in meeting because it's sort of the blend between the King James Version and anything else that people might be reading. Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is now in its latest form called the Christian Standard Bible, CSB, they dropped the Holman, um, is a good version on the whole. It was completed in 2004 and revised in 2009. Again, it uses the critical texts like the rest of them do, except for the New King James. And it comes up with this idea of optimal equivalence, where they're trying to to straddle the fence between word for word and thought for thought. Middle school reading level, published by Holman. English Standard Version came out in 2001 and has been revised three times. This is, as you may may not know this, but this is from the 1971 Revised Standard Version, taken now to a new level and completely redone. Eighth grade. Reading level, formal correspondence, published by Crossway. This is the latest Bible <laughs> to come out, the Legacy Standard Bible. The Legacy Standard Bible, truth be told, is simply the New American Standard by another name. But it has some MacArthurisms. Okay? John MacArthur and the Master's Seminary were behind part of this. He's not the sole source of it. It's also published by Lockman, so it's, it's another version similar to the Uh, New American Standard. It has basically two outstanding features. Number one, it uses the sacred tetragrammaton, the name of the Lord, his covenant name, Yahweh, exclusively in the Old Testament whenever the Hebrew has it. So all the Lord, L-O-R-D, with all capitals that we're used to, are out. If you see Lord in the Old Testament, it's Adonai. 
But if you have the sacred tetragrammaton, it's called the name that God gave, his covenant name, associated with the verb to be, with his being, I am who I am, right? That name is always translated Yahweh. And I pronounce it Yahweh, not Yahweh, because Hebrew is a living language. It's still spoken today, right? And in, he in Hebrew today, you would pronounce that Yahweh. So we're not used to that word. Um, it hasn't been used that often among us, but the Bible is full of it. So the Legacy Standard Bible will do that. The other thing, and this is another, I would call this a MacArthurism, every time the word doulos in Hebrew, and, and Greek, excuse me, in the New Testament, which is the word for servant, every time it is translated slave, MacArthur has a book called Slave. If you haven't read that, it's about what it means to be a servant of God. Not a degraded chattel slavery, but still one who is totally uh, at the at the uh, beck and call, if you will, of the master, someone who is completely subservient. And so those are two quirks in the Legacy Standard Bible. <clears throat> um, tenth grade reading level. Now for the last ten minutes, I want to critique some things, okay? Uh, textual criticism. Well, I was going to talk about King James Version a little bit. There are four uh, people who defend continuing to use the King James Version, and the one that I have great sympathy with is number one. I like it. I like it. It's what I grew up with. The language I learned when I was a child, I was saved through specific wording in that version, and I'm getting older, and I don't intend to change. And there's no reason to change, none whatsoever. It's still an excellent, excellent translation and still used widely throughout the world. <clears throat> so I have great sympathy with that and more power to you if you want to remain with that old text. However, there are other people who say the Greek text behind it is superior. That's a classic conspiracy. The KJV is inspired. <laughs> you say, do some people actually believe that? Oh, yes, they do. In fact, it goes one step further. It's a new revelation. And that was Ruckmanism. Uh, Ruckman has gone to his reward, whether up or down, I don't know. Uh, not to be flippant, but <clears throat> he was a strident, uh, he's a preacher, of course, but just a strident KJV only guy. So I grew up with this, <clears throat> which is Jack Chick now. And basically what's going on in this cartoon is that a student who's a Christian goes to a Bible seminary and he finds his instructor is saying, well, your Bible says this, but, you know, the Greek says this. And for him, this is a, a complete meltdown. He, he says, if I can't trust one word in the Bible, I can't trust any of the words. So he, he uh, if you look carefully, he gives his teacher a bloody nose by shoving the Bible into his face and runs out and becomes an apostate. <clears throat> Anyway, we won't go on any further on that, but I don't think I have to do that with this audience. Lord Jesus and his apostles primarily quoted from a translation. This is just in defense of using translations. They almost always quoted the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew text. Okay. We talked a little bit about dynamic equivalence, and I'm not going to go on any further about that, except to give you some examples. This is another text. This is something about the importance of words. So the, the problem with <clears throat> dynamic equivalence, that is thought for thought, is you become an interpreter. You have to understand not just what the word means or what the phrase means, but you need to understand what the intention was of the author. Well, you may be right, but you could be wrong. And if you're wrong, you're going to put that in print, and everyone who reads your Bible is going to be limited with that information. They're not going to see what the, the actual depth or the possibilities that exist in the original text. So Mary has chosen that good part. Now, the word is good. I remember my dad saying, one of his mentors often said about this, the Lord didn't compare one servant to another. He didn't say Mary's doing something better. He said, Mary has chosen what is good. Just keep that in mind, okay? NLT, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. That's pretty loose method of uh, translating choosing a good part. NIV, which I skipped, Mary has chosen what is better. So we go from a declarative now to a comparative, and the CEV goes further and makes it a superlative. Mary has chosen what is best. Now, these aren't serious errors, but they are not really true to what the original text says. Uh, I have a number of these, and I just picked a few, and we've got about five minutes, so it should be about perfect. 
Dynamic equivalence, that's what DE is, tampers in some ways with the person of Christ. For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, Psalm 2 being quoted in Hebrews chapter 1. Now, that's not how the NLT, for example, or NIV translate it. For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus, You are my son, today I have become your father. That's not the same thing as today I have begotten thee. We know that from commentary on this text and from other truths in the scripture that the Lord Jesus did not become the Son of God when he was born. We don't believe in temporal sonship, right? So this verse, this is essentially teaching temporal sonship, which is a serious mistake. Now here's another one. <clears throat> Theological terms need to be left intact in the Bible. It's the teacher's job to unpack them. It's not the translator's job to unpack them. And you're going to see how this works here. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. This is how the King James reads. So you have three major theological terms there, including what well, grace would be a fourth, but justified, redeemed, and propitiated, right? They're left intact. Someone reading that doesn't know what propitiation means. Uh, might as well say peanut butter. They, they don't know what it means. But that's what the Bible teacher is for. That's, so they, they learn what it means, all right? And they learn that it's a, a, a very heavily freighted theological word. Now, ESV maintains this, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's an excellent translation. It's the best. NLT. Yet now God, in his gracious kindness, so that's what grace is, that's fine, okay, declares us not guilty. Justification just got reinterpreted as not guilty. It means that, but it means a lot more than that, all right? He has done this through Christ Jesus, who has freed us by taking away our sins. Well, redemption does free us, but it means a whole lot more than that. So you can't, you can't do this, okay? I mean, you can, you can do it if you're just like reading along and getting familiar with the book. I'm not against reading. I read the message sometimes. Actually, I frequently do. Mostly to get annoyed, but some, sometimes it, it's a flash of insight. But I don't regard that as a serious Bible for study, okay? It's a commentary. This, I'm not trashing any of these versions. I'm trying to help you select the ones that will be best for your serious study. God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. Well, you could argue that's what propitiation means, but it means more than that. So you see what they've done. They're reductionist. They've dropped it down and defined it in a way that locks the reader out from other truth in those terms. And that is a disservice to the readers. Message. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world. That's an interesting phrase. To clear the world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. I mean, these are a bunch of truisms, but they are not uh, at all what the text says. Okay? And I bring these things out. Grace is more than sheer kindness, justification, redemption, propitiation. All right. Uh, the hope. Hope, this is an excellent example here. Hope in the Bible has two meanings. It has an objective and a subjective meaning. The hope that is before us is actually something that is reserved for us in heaven. It is something we will experience. But hope is also, subjectively, a confident assurance that those things that are promised in the future are mine. So you have my response to an objective truth, something that fortifies my heart because I know what's coming in the future. I have faith in God's Promises, that's my hope. Now, that's why you need to leave it hope, all right? So that you may know what is the hope of his calling, or the hope to which he has called you. Now, God's word puts it this way. You will know the confidence that he calls you to. Well, hope is confidence, but they've just taken away the objective meaning of what really lies ahead for me in heaven, right? NLT does the opposite. So you can understand the wonderful future he has promised to those he called, but they've now taken the subjective confidence out of it. So both are wrong. I think it's best to leave those words intact. Gender distinctions. We can go on about this, but since I'm almost out of time, we'll go quickly. These are some uh, 
guidelines given to the translators that were not supposed to be leaked, <laughs> but I got them. <laughs> I was the sleuth. Um, the patriarchalism of the ancient cultures in which the biblical books were composed is pervasively reflected in forms of expression that deny the common human dignity of all hearers and readers. The Bible denies people human dignity. And another quote there too, but we haven't got time, but that's what they think. So here's what ESV says of John 14, 23. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. You say, well, what about if it's a woman? <clears throat> well, the word him in this sort of grammatical instruction means him or her. And if you want to, you can say him or her. And we will come to him or her and make our home with him or her. Now, no one does that anywhere. Them and they get every get all the, all the usage today, right? Singular and plural, which I oppose, but my little voice is not heard. So ESV maintains that, but look what the New Revised Standard does. Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now you completely lost the truth that this occupation, this this remaining and abiding of God with the believer is true of each individual person. He's not talking about the church. He's not talking about collections of people. He's talking about each individual believer. And you would not know that if you, if you uh, take the gender distinction out. Um, a more uh, serious one is this. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. The translator has to show that the Greek text expects that overseers are going to be male and only male. That's why officials must have a good reputation. Now, a bishop married only once. You see how these are subtle changes that take the gender specificity out of the text. Famous, we've gone through Matthew 18 and 20 many times. J.N. Darby probably has the best translation for where two or three are gathered together. Unto my name, there am I in the midst of them. <clears throat> And this is handled differently, and none of these is seriously wrong, but I think that they have less than perfect uh, translations. Um, message isn't too bad when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure I'll be there. Well, that's all right. Assembly truth. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, the room of the unlearned would be a good example of that, and again, just because of time, I really haven't. Well, let's, let's just look at this. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen? At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. New King James, he who occupies the place of the uninformed. Okay. ESV, anyone in the position of an outsider. Those are actually both acceptable. <clears throat> it's a non-member who's being referred to, who's a Christian, but he's, he's not a member. I, I think uninformed is not as good as outsider. I think outsider is the right word. New American Standard, one who plays, fills the place of the ungifted. Here we have a rare example of the New American Standard lapsing into, trans, into uh, paraphrase and lapsing into dynamic equivalence. They're interpreting what it means to be in the place of the unlearned or the outsider. They think it means he doesn't, the person doesn't have the gift, the gift of tongues that's being spoken of in the chapter. They're incorrect. I think they're incorrect, but they're certainly incorrect to put that in the text. NIV, <clears throat> those who did not understand, you know, NLT completely lost this distinction between a person who is a believer but not in assembly fellowship versus those who are in assembly fellowship. <clears throat> Here's a classic example of... Uh, Love of Christ controls us. What is it? Is it our love for Christ or Christ's love for us? Well, it might, it might be both. It might be both. But you have to leave both options available to the reader. The minute you make a decision for the reader and force him or her to read what you think it means, you've robbed him of the other possibility. So CEV says we are ruled by Christ's love for us. That may be true, but that's not what the text says. Message says Christ's love has moved me to such extremes. Uh, so... These are not being faithful. You need to leave, respect the ambiguities of Scripture. You must respect them, especially on a translation level. So, again, just this trend toward consumerism and marketing and dumbing down the Bible, and I'm all for getting kids picture Bibles and all that. That's fine. I mean, definitely want to get it down to their level. <clears throat> but 
the idea here is very patronizing. It's like young people aren't, aren't able to read a real book, so we have to make them a special version just for them that will entertain them. Give kids the Bible that speaks their language. Okay. This, why, do such, why do young people have such a strong connection with this Bible? Because the 260 dynamite daily devotionals were written by teens. Okay. Well, I've seen some precocious teens who can write a devotional, but I'm not sure that I want to read 260 teen devotionals. Okay. I think there's a certain amount of uh, you know, mature reflection that's required before you publish something like that. All right? Uh, this is Jericho Joe, the cartoon character, leading you through the Old Testament. Uh, Godly decisions are easy with the good Dear Sam advice column and all this. I mean, uh, there's a place for this, but it's not in the Bible text, in my opinion. Okay, There's a place for this. I'm not, I'm not being catty up here or, or being condemning. Um, but I think you need to give people a real Bible. And here's another example. So some people say, you know, one, there's, I guess there's one thing about the King James Version being so old. It kind of reminds you, the Bible's not a new book. It's an old book. Even the people in the New Testament are looking to 2,000 years of history. And so you need to keep some kind of stateliness and some sort of um, timelessness, let's put it that way, in the translation. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am, and so forth. Where today, uh, like the CEV says, some years later God decided to test Abraham. So he spoke to him. The Lord said, go get Isaac. It's like John Donne, death be not proud. Or you could say, death, don't be so stuck up. You're not as great as you think you are. You know, it's, it's, it's taking something that I think has a certain stateliness to it and kind of trivializing it. And I think we need to be careful about that tendency. Um, another example from Sir Samuel. Uh, this is not the Bible, but it's reminding us that it's okay if the Bible's hard to understand. It's okay if you have to think about it. It's okay if you don't get it the first time. Everything can't be completely dumbed down to the point where it's easy to assimilate on the first pass. You need to work at some things, and it's worth the work. And I just put a couple of hymn references in here that remind us of the theological truth that is packed into some of these that would not necessarily be true of modern hymns. And I'm just making the analogy with uh, new Bible versions. Are you familiar with that line by John Darby? This, jar, this uh, words, the, the words of Matheson here, I dare not ask to fly from thee, I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall end this be. It's not immediately apparent what he means by that. And you have to think about it, think what metaphor is he using. And it makes you think, it makes you think. That's what you want to do. Um, and Limol, uh, you have to know the story of the Hebrew servant to understand this. One of my favorites to Calvary, Lord and Spirit, now our weary souls repair. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting sentimental on you here, and I'm over the time. I'm sorry, so I'm really done, except to point out one more, one more thing. This is the last one. This one. No, nope, this one. This is the bottom line. <clears throat> this is a continuum of New Testament or of Bible translations available. The Net Bible is not on here, but I'll tell you where it goes. Going from word for word, which is my preference, or at least staying on the, what is it, stage right, uh, uh, no, stage, stage right, but it's your left. You want to stay on the left end. You want to stay in the left end here, okay? You're, you're allowed to venture about a third of the way in, but not farther. <laughs> All right. So the interlinear, obviously, is the most wooden. Um, New American Standard, Amplified, ESV, RSV. Notice King James is not the most word for word. It's far from it, actually. Some of these newer translations, particularly the ESV, is more true to word for word, for word translation philosophy. When you get into the new RSV, NAB, New Jerusalem Bible, you're getting into more and more paraphrase. Um, I would say the Net Bible belongs just about where the Holman's Christian Standard Bible does. It's flirting with the line. Okay, It's all right, but it's sort of not perhaps the truest, if you're going to hew the line to word-for-word -word translation. And that's it. I'm sorry, I did go 10 minutes over, and uh, <clears throat> but I got pretty much everything done I wanted to cover. So I hope this was interesting. First of all, what's the take-home? Number one, people paid with their lives so you could have a Bible, so appreciate it. Number two, <clears throat> we have a plethora 
of Bibles to choose from. Some are better than others. You want to pick one that you can memorize and make it your go-to Bible and use the others for reference. Loose translations should be viewed as commentaries. They may help enlighten you in some cases, but they should not be taken seriously, not as seriously as your formal correspondence Bible. With that, we'll pray. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> these men who, and women too, people of faith who have brought the scriptures to us in our own language, and we thank you for the truth they contain about the gospel and about being able to know you and be saved from our sins and destined for heaven because of the work of a, a substitute, a savior, Christ himself. We thank you for these precious truths. Help us to revere the word and spend more time with it, be devoted to it. We give thanks for it and for our Lord Jesus in his name. Amen. Thank you very much. I shouldn't run over.